Hello and welcome once again to In the Art Scene. I'm Ron Marcus. And I'm Galena Marcus, and this is a bonus episode. Bonus episode? Yes. Wow, what are we going to be covering today? We are actually talking about NFT, the topic that we really wanted to cover. And we had that chance with Michal Bacha, who is married to one of our previous interviewee, Angelique Bacha, from episode number 11. He graciously agreed to have a little time with me and talk a little bit about what NFT is and how to deal with it in the art world. And trust me, he knows a lot. Yes, he is an economist and he's going to demystify just how NFTs work and why artists should be interested. Or should not. Well, let's figure it out. Let's go. All right. Hi, Michael. And thank you for joining joining me today in the middle of your workday. It's the middle of the workday, right? For you. Yes. Yes. It's very early for you, I guess. 7 a.m., right? It is 7 a.m., yeah. Yeah. That's called dedication. <laughs> <laughs> doing my best. <laughs> All right. Uh, how about we start with a very, very quick introduction, and you will tell the listeners about who you are and what you do. Okay, we can do that. So, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Michael Bacha, or Michał, that's in Polish. That's my original Polish name. Uh, I am a a crypto uh, token economist. So, I'm involved in different uh, token and cryptocurrency and blockchain projects. And I use my the combined knowledge and expertise that I gained over the years, because you know, I, I, I graduated from a university of economics with a master's degree. I was not able to use my, let's say, uh, formal education for a while. I, I did a lot of projects in the technology space, in, uh, in renewable energy, in finance. But around 2016-17, I noticed the, the, a thing called blockchain and projects like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, And I've discovered that uh, any crypto, any blockchain project, they they should really talk to an economist because they they have a, let's say, either a monetary policy going on or some sort of socioeconomic incentive structure built into the token. Uh, So I started working for companies doing consulting work for them. And then I did more and more of this work. And uh, the majority of the projects I talked to uh, were horrible. And my professional advice to them was, don't do it. You either gonna end up in jail or bankrupt or both. So so, so don't do it. But luckily I came across a few very high quality projects and, and great people in the space and um, a, a little bit of bragging, you know, I, I work for one of the prime cybersecurity companies right now in the, in the blockchain space. I do some work for them. I'm a token economist for a project called, a project called Energy Web, which is one of the, the best blockchain projects uh, out there. Uh, I also won the Lufthansa Aviation Blockchain Challenge for designing a loyalty rewards system on the blockchain using token economics. Uh, and uh, my one of my medium articles is part of the MIT Sloan uh, blockchain curriculum right now. So uh, yeah, wow. that's for a little bit wow. dragging and introduction. <laughs> that's impressive. <laughs> that's impressive. Uh, I got the right guy on the podcast. <laughs> that's for sure. All right. And uh, uh, what is going to be also important for our listeners, I think, is that you are a very supportive husband of your artist wife, who we all know from the episode number 11. Her name is Angelique Bacha. And uh, yeah, and I believe we even mentioned uh, the possibility of bringing you and talking about NFTs today. So, um, yeah, yes, it is. I, I confirm. That's my wife. I'm very proud of her. Yes. <laughs> oh, here are my, all, all, the, all the husbands out there. <laughs> Pay attention, please. <laughs> now, look, look. I mean, if, if we can spend a, a minute or two talking about it, it's so easy to support her because, you know, when you see a person that they actually are following their calling 
uh, and you see them flourish and shine and they, they're just happy. I mean, it's so easy to support that. And, and you know, it's almost like uh, to, to anybody who, who has any doubt whether to follow your passion or your dream, you can always go back doing a mundane job. You can always go back. And this is what, what uh, we had conversations uh, about. And I have to tell you that uh, to all the <laughs> listeners, She's also a very supportive wife, and she supported me in pursuing my my dream, and uh, I I appreciate it very much. So yeah, we we we're, we we like each other and <laughs> we, we support each other. Uh, so yeah, it is mutual. Oh, this is so wonderful. I know you guys for a few years, and you were a very nice and very inspiring couple. And yeah, I wish everybody had the relationships. At least half of what you do. So. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We, yeah, we, we make a good impression. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. All right. Well, um, speaking about that, you helped Angelique develop her first NFT. And this is Correct. how this whole conversation started because I know that she dipped her toes in this water with your help. And I also know that NFT among the art community right now is is a, such a buzzword, but okay. barely anyone really understands what stands behind it and what value for the art community it actually brings. Okay. And I, I'm I'm saying the word value, but I actually have my own reservations in prejudice against the whole thing, which I'm not gonna say. And I want to see if by the end of this conversation, you will convince me otherwise. Okay. Well, you know, I'm not in the business of convincing uh, anybody. I, I'm happy to explain what I know. And then everybody can decide for themselves. So with, with Angelique, the story was, I was kind of relentless about telling her that she should do it. And finally, I dragged her into doing it, kicking and screaming. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, so here we are. But you know, in in all seriousness, let's take it step by step, right? So, so first, NFT stands for non fungible token, right? And why why the name? Uh, the token refers to a token on on a blockchain, and uh, I mean. Maybe we shouldn't go too deep into the weeds about you know what blockchain is. Let, let's just assume that blockchain is a is a decentralized technology that uh, is very good at holding a secure record of different transactions. And for example, Bitcoin is an example of a token on the blockchain, and uh, people hold Bitcoin because. It is a completely decentralized way of storing information and financial records uh, where it is completely global. It is not tied to a specific location and is completely decentralized in the sense that no centralized authority, no government, and nobody can delete a record over there or take away your tokens. And bitcoins are tokens that are fungible, which basically means there is no distinction between one particular Bitcoin or another particular Bitcoin. If I send you a Bitcoin, a fraction of a Bitcoin, uh, you don't really care uh, which token uh, on the chain particularly is that. This is like a dollar bill. You, you, I, I give you a dollar bill, you did give me another dollar bill. It, it has the same value, it has the same functionality. And non-fungible tokens is a concept that basically says that, okay, let's create a token that has a, a, a unique properties and there will be only one or, I don't know, two or a limited collection of 10. Uh, and that each of them is somehow individually identifiable by, by the blockchain itself and by the technology that interacts with it. And why is it interesting in the our world, uh, I think m mainly because, you know, this is the difference between a printed copy of a painting, uh, which there can be infinite uh, copies of, and something that is only one and unique and you can never reproduce it, which is an original painting. Right? 
right? like the Mona Lisa. So, so the the analogy of NFTs and and art are uh, quite uh, obvious, uh, and the uniqueness and the let's say um, scarcity of of the object that you're creating is one of the key properties. And maybe just for context, the digital technology is wonderful, but it was kind of lacking this uh, very uh, necessary uh, quality of being unique and being scarce and unreproducible. And I mean, this is why there was such a big uh, problem that came along with, for example, where uh, the digital music came along. And people stopped buying records and everybody was copying stuff uh, mm -hmm. of the internet and it was only the streaming services that kind of solved this problem through, through, through convenience. But similar thing is especially in the digital art realm because if there is a designer who designs uh, I know, great websites, right? once it's out on the internet, anybody else can go there, copy those designs and, and, and just you know steal it and, and use it without giving any credit or paying for it. Right? And NFTs, the, 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 those tokens on the blockchain have this scarcity built into them. So you cannot freely copy them. There can be only one or X, let's say, uh, versions of, of this particular token. And they can be used in uh, various forms or, or various applications of digital technologies to interact with the technology and actually guarantee the, the proper way of distributing it. While you were talking about that, I was trying to bring some analogies in my head to kind of wrap this whole idea around. So if we're talking about the dollar bills, so yes. the current dollar bills are all the same values. But if you take, yes. for example, I don't know, a, a dollar bill from 1800s that doesn't have a value, it, it's not it's not applicable in the current economic situation you can't pay with that bill in the in the store right but mm -hmm. itself as as the object it has a value because it's a historic uh, antique whatever so you yeah. it's the only one or very few of them still exist and it's like yes. i don't know yes. a mu museum item yeah. so who yeah. are kind of comparing dollar to dollar right yeah, <laughs> so, yeah exactly or, or maybe another analogy could be for example, anybody can uh, download a copy of the Bible of the internet right now mm -hmm. for free. But if you had the first printed copy of the mm -hmm. Gutenberg Bible, I mean, that's something different. That, that's priceless right now, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what's the purpose of having, let's say, for the art world? I kind of understand the problem with the music world and maybe even digital art, right? Yes. Because those work those artworks they already exist in the digital space they are yes. recorded they are uploaded or they're designed mm -hmm. on the computer and they're native to a digital space mm -hmm. so for the visual artists for example like angelique and myself who mm -hmm. are creating um you know the actual physical paintings mm -hmm. what value does nft have for us what we did for Angelique, we created a collection. Well, she uh, cr created a collection of five paintings, and she she just painted, right? And then what she did, she scanned those five paintings in a very high resolution, uh, good good quality scans, and uh, we created five non fungible tokens. So for every NFT, we uh, uploaded the digital version of the painting to the token, to the NFT. And also there is a space or a section on the platform where you can post content that only the owner of the token can access. So over there, there is a password and there is a secret link that only the owner of the token can unlock. And when they access it, they find a folder where they see some more photos of this painting and different kind of staging uh, uh, pictures. And there's a certificate of authenticity of the painting itself. 
And the story or the idea behind this whole project was that we are creating two twins. One twin is the analog real world twin, and the other is the digital one. And whoever buys the digital twin, because it was auctioned, it was listed, if they present it to us, then they will be sent the analog copy of the, or, or the analog original, if you will. And the idea is for the collector to have both. They can put one analog painting on their wall and they can have the NFT token in their digital wallet to have. And let's say the value that say the collectors, this is what I've, I've heard and, and I've seen people discuss. The value for the collector comes, let's say, it, it is a little bit gimmicky right now, of course. Let's, let's not pretend it's not. But long term, this is a very convenient provenance solution because on blockchain, every transaction recorded is recorded forever. So from the origination of the token, every single transaction can be easily tracked by anybody and can be visible to, to anybody. So you can actually see which particular person held this token throughout this lifetime. And what's also very important, and for me in the art world, this is a game changer, the transparency of the transaction. So if this token gets sold, everybody knows how much and who paid for it. And this sets sort of a benchmark for any other work of this artist. And, and it's also a signal for other collectors what they should expect. And this is something that I love about the, the blockchain technology. I mean, the transparency of it and kind of putting stuff in the open because, you know, I, I'm kind of an insider into the art world and the opaque nature of, of the art industry and how galleries work and how some art dealers operate. I mean, it, it's horrible. It's horrible. And it's almost like, you know, how much is the painting? Well, the painting is however much are you stupid enough to pay for it. This is, this is usually the conversation between the art dealer and the collector, you know? So having the, the NFT, having the blockchain to register the provenance of the analog original and having the record of all those transactions in the past, I think that, that that's a real value. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. So uh, I have a question though. Do all NFTs work like that? That original needs to be attached to the digital? And obviously not, because I have uh, seen other artists doing just the unique. And maybe some of them are going, you know, a little bit a different route. They create a digital art that is maybe animated or has mm -hmm. certain effects, or they apply some effects on top of the high resolution scan. I think your idea with a collector having both analog and digital version is a really interesting one. The question is, what if one of the collectors will decide to sell original and keep the NFT well, or otherwise? They can, but it's kind of like depreciates the value of both. I mean, they are more valuable as a pair. Okay. So why would you split them? You know? Makes sense. I mean, of, yeah, I mean, people can do stupid things, but it's almost like if you buy a painting and you cut it into pieces, well, yeah, you can do it. It's just stupid, right? Yeah, it makes sense from the economic perspective. Uh, on the other hand, so to me, NFT is is pretty much it's the stock exchange or it's like auction, a big auction, right? It's like Christie's, oh. right? So or maybe a casino, even or even a, yeah, even a casino. <laughs> so to me, when I think about that, it has no other value but monetization, right? So Definitely. it's just a way of making money. So if someone wants to make a money on NFT, they possessed it for a few years, they sold it, but they still want to enjoy the painting, they keep it on the wall. Well, sure. I mean, th this is definitely something that can happen, but, you know, maybe looking at it from a different perspective. If somebody is buying a contemporary painting and is paying $80 million for it, it's not because he's in love with this painting. Because if you're an art lover, you can go to a freaking museum, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is a way for people to invest money and diversify their, their portfolio. And uh, this comes from the fact that I buy something that is very scarce right now. It's going to be even more scarce in the future. And there will be a lot of other rich people that want it. Right? 
So there is a very, very similar dynamics with NFTs. This is absolutely uh, true. And it's almost like, you know, if we're going to remove the economics part of it, and if you don't have to make any money off of your art, then, yeah, why would you bother? It doesn't make any sense because if you just want to, let's say, share your art with the world, uh, make a digital print of it, uh, put it uh, somewhere online, attach some sort of you know, open source license to it, and then say, hey, enjoy, right? I don't care. So uh, I, I completely agree that, you know, you, you cannot talk about, um, I mean, you can talk about NFTs without talking about money, but it's kind of like meaningless and point. So the point that NFT is not about appreciating art, is about making money off of art, or it's an investment mechanism. Well, is I mean, it's actually valid. It's, it's, a, it's a complex uh, discussion, but what, what I can agree with you on is, is, is the fact that if you don't care about the money part of art, then why would you bother? Why would you go through all this trouble? even doing this is completely let's say agree unless you care about proving provenance of this piece of work and the authorship of it right but if you are operating from a completely let's say i don't care perspective i don't care if i'm gonna get any credit i don't care about showing to the world that i was the first who created it then yeah it's pointless but maybe, you know, uh, a, a small comment about the, let's say, value pricing and, and, and the economics of it. It's interesting also from the I enjoy art point of view because the pricing of different pieces of art is in of itself a curation mechanism because we live in a world right now that is so abundant in, in different products, also different art pieces, that there is simply not enough time in your lifetime to sift and sort through everything that is out there by yourself. So you need to apply some sort of curation algorithm to just focus on a specific piece of, of the artwork that you want to enjoy, right? And, you know, some people say, okay, I'm just going to go to my favorite museum and I'm going to let the museum do the curation for me, right? But another, I would say, equally valid uh, idea is I'm just interested in looking at art that is the most expensive. Why not, right? So I would say this is just a small comment about if you're only doing it for the sake of loving art. I mean, maybe this is the, the, the part that is interesting for you. And also maybe uh, the, the, the provenance part is, is also very intriguing because we watched a documentary about a lady who lives somewhere in California, and she's a retired truck driver who came into a possession of a Pollock uh, painting that wasn't signed. And the evidence is plain and, and kind of obvious that this is a Pollock painting. They have proven that it was painted in his studio in this particular period of time. It has his paint on it. And it, it, the, the only thing that is missing is not signed, and it hasn't been cataloged. And nobody wants to authenticate this painting for her because for the art world, it would be admitting that they don't know what they're doing, really, right? That is very interesting. Yeah, uh, I've heard that story before, and I will appreciate if you also send me the link to that documentary so I can share it with everybody. <laughs> My point is not only the, let's say, monetary value comes from provenance, but some sort of authorship or, or, or recognition, it also comes from, the, from provenance that can be easily proven. And this is a great use case for NFTs. Yeah, um, I agree with the case of the provenance. My personal reservations about the, the whole money thing is uh, out of table. But I actually, speaking about uh, the investment part of NFTs, I actually wanted to ask you, what is actually really behind it uh, for the artist? How easy or difficult it is? Uh, because I know that uh, NFTs actually re require uh, some upfront investment to create. Uh, and then it, it's 
a whole different story of marketing and selling them because it's not like you put it out there and it's been immediately sold and you get your royalties yes. and uh, it's yes. yeah it's not guaranteed yeah. so and i think that's that's a misconception that i hear the m- more frequently a lot of artists are getting excited about that oh i will create the nfts because you know the the way it's, it was presented to the art community is that hey you see someone did that and they sold it for five million dollars seven million dollars whatever so artists who are struggling with marketing themselves or making enough living from their craft and they still want to pursue doing it because they love it and want to guarantee their well-being you know financially they thought that this is oh this is the easy way for me to get on the other side and just live my life and enjoy my painting while that thing is passively working for me bringing me income and it's actually not that easy and that's what kind of bothers me in this whole idea of nfts is how easily artists are no i shouldn't i shouldn't say fooled but convinced convinced or like it almost sounds like a manipulation manipulated into okay, yes well, i'm with you look this is just a technology it's not a magic wand it's not a silver bullet and i would put it in the same category i mean what, what you're mentioning is again being a little bit on the inside of the art industry there is a whole industry of uh, i will teach you how to make a living doing your art teachers gurus digital courses and i'm doing so well for myself and i will teach you how to do it and all you have to do is pay me i don't know 199 <laughs> and and then buy a subscription of you know 10 dollars a, a week yeah. so so yeah yeah that's the that's the thing that i can have like a, a an hour rant about <laughs> and i probably will at some point because it yeah, bugs but- the heck out of me So, I mean, the the same applies to NFTs, right? You need to understand that companies that advertise their NFT platforms to artists do it not because they want to help artists, but because they want to make a lot of money. And they make money on transaction fees and they make money on commissions and and on advertising and so on. So I would say, yeah, I mean, use your, let's say, common sense and critical judgment. And in terms of the cost, again, there are several, let's say, underlying blockchain technologies. And the most popular, the most prominent one is the Ethereum blockchain. And at the, let's say, height of the NFT hype, like two months ago, the the blockchain network fees were actually quite high. So for launching one of those paintings i mean we had to pay just in network fees around 80 dollars so you know if you're selling a piece of digital art for five dollars and you have to pay (laughs) at 80 dollars in network fees to do it well obviously you're not going to make any money right yeah but there are let's say different uh, blockchain technologies out there there are platforms that have uh, significantly lower transaction fees, which um, you know, that's like one cent, ten, ten cent sort of transaction fees, which are let's say very affordable. And then there is always a question of uh, how much do you have to pay for actually listing your token on on the platform, etc. And about the marketing thing, I completely agree that you need to do your own marketing no one's going to do it for you unless you pay them a lot of money and those nft platforms go after people who already have a lot of following because for them it's market you know and i mean this is just how it works so i would say that the fact that somebody sold an nft for a million dollars or half a million 
It's not because it was an NFT, but because this person had a following of, I don't know, 15 million uh, other people, right? So I would say NFT is a great way of monetizing the following that you already have. It's, it's a brilliant way uh, of doing. And definitely, if you already have, I don't know, a million Instagram followers or, or YouTube followers, if you're going to go to any of those platforms, they will be more than happy to help you. And you're going to get basically ro royal treatment. <laughs> and, uh, and they're going to help you with, with creating those NFTs, listing them and marketing them. Because, you know, for them, it's, it's a potential audience of, of another um, a million or two or how many followers you have. So creating NFT to increase your value as an artist and increase your following is like putting the cart before the horse, pretty much. Well, so you, still you know, I would say if this is part of your broader strategy or kind of long-term vision, I mean, because the question is like, let's make it very clear that uh, this is part of the monetization strategy for you, right? Because again, if somebody doesn't care about making money, then this whole discussion is completely pointless because you're just going to pay those network fees, like $80 at the height, maybe 40 right now. Uh, what was the point? doesn't matter, right? It's just a gimmick, maybe show to your parents or I, I don't know. But if you... Uh, are an artist that want, uh, who, who wants to uh, support themselves doing your art. There has to be, it's almost like a business planning thing or a business strategy thing, understanding who's going to pay for it, what is the target market, what do they want, uh, why do they want it, is there some sort of alignment between what I do and what they want, how much they are paying and stuff like this, how to reach them. And, and this is kind of, you know, business 101. And I understand that artists, they really don't want to be involved in the business part because they want to be artists. So this is very natural. But uh, I, I, I completely agree that if NFT is a part of a, it's a, a broader strategy for you, good for you, it is a tool that can be very well utilized because there is a lot of wealthy collectors in the crypto space. And for them, the, the part that the, this is the, an, an NFT, and maybe there is an analog art connected to it somehow, can be attractive, can increase the value of the artist is doing. However, it's like, you know, in the real world, you need persistence. You need to put yourself out there in a consistent way. and you need to create a history. It's like, you know, if it's just one dot, it's, it's, it's not going to be noticed. But if it's dot after dot after dot, after putting several dots in the same direction, now you create a line, and the line is much more recognizable by the outside world. But I completely agree with you. If somebody thinks that I have finally found the missing piece of the puzzle, and this is NFT, then you, you're probably wrong. It's, it's probably not going to happen if, if you're going to go through all the hassle of putting your token out there, and then you're just going to have a token that nobody's going to care about. That, that, that's it. So creating an NFT is not decreasing the, all the administrative and marketing work that artists have to do if they want to support themselves with art. It actually is increasing. <laughs> <laughs> because now... Now, well, you, uh, on top of all, yeah, on top of all the art fairs and Instagram and everything, you guys need to promote an NFT because yeah, the NFT will not work. To manage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, okay, I uh, that actually was the main point that I wanted to clarify, and I, I'm really grateful that you did it for me. Is there anything else? Maybe we can list the steps for the artist who wants to get there and, and investigate the possibility for themselves to create an NFT and list the NFT. So what are all the steps from researching the platform to 
creating the actual digital file? What are the fees along the ways? Because there's transaction fee. I, I don't know if it applies to artists or not. Uh, and there's a listing fee, and maybe there are some other hidden things that we don't know about. Okay. So let's say in terms of practical advice, um, I would say maybe a disclaimer. This space is evolving extremely rapidly. Any specific information we're going to give to the listeners right now will be obsolete in the week. So I would say, first of all, if you can reach out to somebody who has done it, try finding people and you can look for them on different Facebook groups, Telegram groups, Discord uh, groups. Crypto community is pretty open to newcomers and pretty open with sharing ideas because it was born out of this idea of decentralization and, and sharing. I mean, people can get pretty nasty over there and there's a lot of juvenile humor over there and, and crudeness. But if you can, you know, let's say, look, look past it, you can find a genuinely good people in the crypto space that will help you. I know that I am still part of the San Diego Bitcoin group on Telegram. And there are people over there interested in NFTs that they have experience over there. So I would say, talk to a real person who has some experience with this. This is number one. Number two, the question is, how technically savvy are you? Because let's say NFTs are built on an open source technology. so. It is absolutely possible for anybody to create those NFT for themselves, by themselves, for free, without paying anything. But it actually requires some coding skills, some technical knowledge. But if you have a friend who is I know, a software developer in the crypto space, they might help. Now, there are several, let's say, consumer-facing, friendly NFT platforms out there. We used one of them, and I mean, what we did was basically do a Google search for NFT platforms or NFT marketplaces. And it, as I mentioned, it changes rapidly. So I would say maybe it's good to take a look at each one of them to kind of get a feel what kind of art is listed over there. Because it's good to have sort of like a, a art marketplace match. Or, or alignment. I mean, there are places that focus more on, let's say, serious or traditional uh, art forms that are curated. And some marketplaces are just, you know, just, we don't care. Put whatever you want over there. We don't care. Uh, the mess is going to solve itself out. And instead, in terms of fees, the first thing is you need to pay the network fees of the underlying blockchain. And usually you need to have some sort of cryptocurrency to pay it. And the majority of those platforms operates on the Ethereum blockchain. So you're going to need Ethereum token or ETH, ETH. So you need to buy yourself some of these. And depending on your location, you can use different companies uh, that actually let you pay with your credit card for, for, for cryptocurrencies. And then there is a, you know, a little bit of complexity of transferring your purchased tokens to your wallet that you're going to use with this particular platform. But I would say more often than, than not, those platforms are pretty good at explaining the technicalities even to newcomers, because, I mean, their, their business model depends on being user-friendly. Well, that's something I did not know, actually. That's very interesting. So if, uh, if I'm not, for example, completely involved into uh, cryptocurrencies, not only I need to go through all the steps of creating the NFT, I also will have to go and buy my own cryptocurrency yes. and to, to make a transaction. Yes. Yes, and you know, I would say brace yourself because 99.9% .9 of transactions will happen in this cryptocurrency. So if you're lucky enough to, to, to sell it, somebody's going to pay you in this cryptocurrency. 
So now it's it's a question for you how you're going to convert it to real money, right? <laughs> oh, that, okay, that's another that's an, that's another good point. So it's not like you're getting a million dollars, you're getting million dollars in cryptocurrency. <laughs> well, you you're getting a token that at some point in time was worth a million dollars, but tomorrow can be worth 2 million and 3 days after half a million, right? I mean the volatility is is, is quite significant on the so it's not like you're getting a, a direct, like a wire transfer to your bank account of a million no. dollars. No. Okay, that's a good one. Okay, what else? And you know, the, the, the paradox with all the situation is that everybody in the world has equal access to those crypto payment methods, irrespectively of the jurisdiction. It's kind of leveling the playing field for people from all over the world, selling their art on the global marketplaces. But, you know, paradoxically, for example, in countries like the U.S., it can be a struggle to actually liquidate your, your assets in a in a way that is compliant and then you know report it properly on <laughs> tax returns and, and 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 stuff like this. So so first of all, in order to have those NFTs launched and actually created, you need to pay network fees that will be charged in the native token of, of the blockchain network. Then if you get paid, you're gonna get those tokens as well. You need to do something with them. And then if you sell those tokens in America, most countries probably the same thing, you need to actually report it on your tax return, right? So I, I'm not going to get into it. I mean, it's very <laughs> complicated. Uh, it's, it's better to talk to, to a good accountant uh, that specializes in this area. But I mean, on the, on the plus side of it is if somebody is just doing an experiment and you're going to sell it and you're going to have a few tokens in a digital wallet, I don't think you have to report it only when you actually sell it for for dollars. But again, I'm I'm not an accountant. So <laughs> don't take my word for it. <laughs> it changes quickly. All right. So then then there is a question of paying if there are any listing fees, but usually there aren't. And then how those platforms work. If somebody buys your NFT, they charge a commission out of this transaction. So they make money when, when you make money. Now, the, the interesting aspect of, of many of these platforms is that they let you charge a commission on your work that other people are trading. And this, I, th I think, is quite, quite an interesting scenario. So basically, you can declare or you can, you can decide that from every transaction in the future, People trading this NFT, you're gonna get, I don't know, a five percent cut. So basically, every time, if somebody bought it for one dollar from you and, and now is selling for a million dollars, you're gonna get five percent of this million. Um, and, and you are deciding it when you're creating uh, yes. a listing, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, so you're dictating those rules, not the platform. Correct. Correct. Okay, that that's also very interesting. <laughs> Yes, I mean, that, 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 that this kind of royalty uh, sort of uh, monetization idea, I think it's, it's a very interesting idea. It's a very interesting idea because especially for artists who are, uh, let's call it, uh, up and coming, because it's almost like, yes, you are selling your art at a lower valuation right now, but when you're actually uh, going to make a name for yourself, you're actually going to benefit from all those past works that you've created and uh, i think it's fair I, I i like this idea very much yeah it's an interesting idea for the for the younger artists especially especially uh, the internet native born generation <laughs> well <laughs> you yeah, know what there's another very interesting aspect of of nfts that i want to mention the internet native aspect of it there are virtual communities out on the internet. I think one is called Decentraland. There are probably some, some other projects. And the interesting thing about these places is they're 100% virtual and they actually have a way of showcasing your art in their digital environment over there. And they are actually galleries being created over there in those virtual worlds that feature those NFTs. And I, I think that's a great innovation. It's a great use case. And, you know, if, if, if you think about, I know, the world in 50 years from now, 
the question is like how much of our lives are we going to live actually in those virtual settings and how much in the so-called cold real world or analog world outside uh, th th this is very interesting what's happening and then nft is a is a great way of interacting with with these environments because this is this kind of digital scarcity that we are talking about right it, you, it cannot be easily reproduced and it can only be in one place uh, at a time. So if one gallery in this virtual world has it, no other galleries can feature the same piece of art. That's very interesting. So I have a question following this. Getting back to selling the NFT and uh, also comparing the analog world of art with the digital world of art. So... Uh, you as an artist decide what the size of the royalty you're getting from every transaction when yes. your NFT is circulating in the blockchain. The blockchain uh, well, defines... To, defines... To, I'm sorry, to, 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 to be specific, inside the platform, uh -huh. because let's say a blockchain is a, let's say, decentralized infrastructure for storing all this data. And if you... I mean, right now, I am not aware of any technical solution that will let you enforce this sort of mechanics everywhere on the blockchain. So, I mean, this royalty that you get paid is, let's say, enforceable inside those platforms that we're talking about. So I go to a website. There is a marketplace. Inside this marketplace, I launch my token. And all the people inside this marketplace on this website trading this token have to pay me my royalty because this is enforced by the platform. But technically, there is a possibility of taking this token and taking it, removing it from this platform. This is the nature of the blockchain. And then, I mean, whatever you're going to do with it, you can give it to somebody else and you can have a payment that is in dollars completely off-chain, right? O offline. Mm -hmm. and, and then, the, I mean, it cannot be enforced for, for the okay. time being. So there's yeah? a risk there. Well, I would say, let's, let's put it out there. This extra functionality is available inside those platforms right now, but I am aware that a lot of projects are working on having some sort of universal system on the blockchain enforcing uh, all of this. But I, I, I don't think we are there yet. Maybe, I mean, six months, maybe 12 months. But this is definitely the, let's say, the roadmap of, for the ecosystem or for the industry. Okay, so but but at the moment there is actually a risk that the token can be taken out of this particular space to another space or elsewhere, and then yes. you lose your uh, right. way of monetizing on it, right? Well, yeah, but you still can keep track of what's happening. Okay, rewinding back a little bit. So yeah. let's say we are staying in the same platform and tra yes. transactions are happening as expected. Yes. Uh, you define your own uh, royalty. The yes. platform defines the transaction fee that they're charging yes. wh whoever is transaction going between. But those galleries that you were talking about, the digital galleries, do mm -hmm. they take their cut? Because in the real world, if you show at the gallery, they take up to 50%. I don't know any specific gallery in the digital space. Probably they do the same thing. I wouldn't expect anything else from them. <laughs> Maybe the commissions are lower. Okay, well, that's another thing to investigate. That's another thing to investigate. All but, right. I mean, look, I, I don't really see a problem of people making money off of art. I just prefer situations that are transparent. Everybody knows what's going on. And there is kind of like a balance of, like a balanced exchange of energy, if you will. Like you can get a lot of money if you contribute a lot, but if your contribution is minuscule, why the hell would I pay you 50, 60 percent commission? Right? I mean, if I'm the artist, and and, and this is, I mean, this is the same uh, that applies to the real world analog galleries and and digital stuff. It's it's the same. If I'm the artist and I have to do all the marketing for you, and then at the end you're gonna charge me 50 percent. I mean, this is a bad deal. In, in every book, this is a bad deal, right? So, again, if there are galleries, and, and those platforms are actually quite reasonable. Let's say, just as a side note, those NFT platforms, I mean, 
this is nothing extraordinary. They, 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 they charge a few, few percent maybe on, on a transaction and it's obviously the seller paying and it's success only and there is no nonsense like, you know, listing fees. Well, and, you know, of course they want to push you to do marketing for them, uh, but, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, you, you, you give me all the software that I don't have to learn how to code uh, and launch smart contracts by myself. And then after we make money, we split it and you get like a few percent of it. That's kind of a fair deal versus, you know, certain well-established galleries that I know of in Southern California that will tell you, okay, we're going <laughs> to take your piece and we're going to charge you 60%. And by the way, why don't you do marketing <laughs> for your artwork and also for our gallery for us? But I mean, this, this is a bit silly, right? Yeah. That's an interesting, really interesting conversation. Thank you so much. That was really, really valuable conversation. I did prove some of the points that I already had for myself, and I also learned uh, a lot of new stuff. And I also, I, I totally get and I totally agree with your point about the transparency and keeping the records of the history of the artwork. That's really a, a cool feature. Personally, what I would think is I would probably wait and see how this whole thing evolves because there are still a lot of risks and it's still too gimmicky for me. To, to be honest with you, the risk is mainly on the collector's end. This is where I see majority of those risks. Because if somebody's going to pay half a million for something that is an NFT and supposedly is not reproducible, but maybe it is, who knows, because the technology is still developing. This is where I see the risk. From the artist's point of view, I would encourage everybody to do their own research, never pay anybody in advance, except for maybe network fees for a transaction. And if you're willing to spend a little bit of your time and maybe I don't know, up to $100 on those network fees, I mean, go for it because th this is how, how you learn. And there is also the benefit of being an early adopter in this technology, right? It's like being early on Instagram, being early on YouTube. There is value in it. So in terms of the risk, yes, of course. But I would say they're mainly, the, the, the higher risk are mainly on the collector's end. I see. Well, yeah, uh, that's also a good point. Being an early adopter and learning as the technology evolves, that, that's, a, that's a good point. And by yeah, the way, and then, by the and time... then you can launch a ebook and a course that costs $1.99 <laughs> how to create your NFTs. That's a great point. Yeah. <laughs> that's an awesome point. And don't forget that you have to still do all your marketing for this. <laughs> Yeah, Whatever. Well, I'll hire somebody who, who or hire marketing. Somebody, yeah. But but yeah, I mean those platforms they are very happy to help anybody who has probably north of hundred thousand followers on any of the major platforms. But if you're just, you know, let's say an up and coming, you're still building your, your audience, then yeah, you need you need to do you need to do it yourself. All right. All right, thank you so much, Michael. My pleasure. Anytime. Yeah. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll be calling you back. Good, good. Let's do <laughs> Checking it. in on the yeah. NFT world periodically. Yes, great stuff. <laughs> Thank you so okay. much and enjoy your day. I've got a joke for you, honey. Is it about two Slavs coming into the bar? No. Okay. Two Slavic speakers walk into a podcast. What do they talk about? <laughs> Shut up. Well, you know, how often do you get to hear a Polish speaker and a Russian speaker in the same podcast? Two Slavic languages coming together. It's kind of like Reese's peanut butter cups, chocolate and peanut butter. Two great tastes that taste great together. That was awesome. I enjoyed it. Yeah, well, savor this rare opportunity. Well, and more importantly, we got to learn about NFTs and how they work, pros and cons, uh, why artists should consider using them, but also the potential pitfalls. Or not, we're early days. It's it's like the wild, wild west. So it's like any tool, I think, if you go into it with the right expectations and you get properly educated on how to use it, it can be useful for you. But you do need to calibrate your expectations, especially nowadays with things changing all the time. 
I think you're right, honey. The key word here is the right expectations. And what bothers me the most about NFTs is that this topic has been blown out of the proportions in the art world. And a lot of artists are jumping into this idea without proper knowledge or without really understanding the risks and how things work and what effort and investment are required from them. So I'm super grateful to Michal to take his time and share his knowledge with us and help us put things into the right places. And we are going to be watching this space closely and we'll take a revisit on this topic maybe in six months to a year and see where we are with NFTs and if they lived up to their promise. And who knows, maybe in six months I will have my own NFT and we'll share my own experience. That would be another episode. It sure will be. Well, that's a great way to wrap up this episode. So thanks for joining us. And we'll see you in season two of In, in the, the Art Scene. scene.